morning. Hi, I'm Monty Eves, and welcome to this edition of our Hub video. Today we want to talk about some additional information related to the article in this much journal. So, in the article, we talk about some really important factors, and that is how we do the randomization, who does a randomization, and this is important when the randomization is done in relationship to the treatment that we're going to do. It's important to remember that randomization is one of the tools we have to fight the presence of bias in the studies that we do in clinical trials. It's important to remember bias isn't something conscious. If you are consciously making an effort to change the outcome, that's, sorry, just simply intellectual dishonesty, and it really has no place in science. What bias is is that subconscious factors. It's deeply seated in the way our brains work and it's part of being human. It's impossible to totally eliminate and therefore we have the tools to address that. So randomization is one of those tools and randomization works by reducing the chance that our pre-knowledge of the patient is going to change the way that we conduct the study. So for instance Let's say you're doing a study on body contouring and you're comparing your new favorite treatment to, say, an old treatment. You might subconsciously choose the skinnier patients or the patients that are more committed to diet and exercise or the patients that have better scarring characteristics based on their skin type or ethnicity if you don't randomize. So randomized takes away that bias. Again, it's not a conscious decision, but it is a subconscious decision that can really affect the validity of your outcomes. There's at least two other mechanisms that we can think about in terms of taking care of that pre-knowledge that may affect. Another one besides randomization is allocation concealment. What is that? Well, it basically means that after we randomize a patient, we hide that information from certain people. They may be hidden from the patient, and that can be really important because, as an example, let's say you're doing a study on a new, sexy, minimally invasive laser stem cell technology that everybody is really excited about, and you're comparing it to some old, boring, traditional thing that may or may not be just as good. If the patient knows that they're going to get the old boring thing, they might actually pull out of the trial because that's not what they want. So if they're hidden and they've agreed to be in the trial, you hide that from them. In the same way, you also want to hide, if you can, from the treating physician as long as possible. Let's give another example. Let's say you're doing a study and you're comparing the scar outcome on brachioplasty. You're going to take one arm and you're going to do it the new fancy way to do the final layer closure. And on the other arm, you're going to use the traditional way. So how might that be affected by allocation concealment? Well, the more you hide that by randomizing late and by hiding the allocation might mean that you're less likely to subconsciously treat those two arms differently. So how might that be? Well, let's say you mark the side you want a better scar on subconsciously to be looser in terms of the resection, which might very well give a better scar in and of itself, regardless of the treatment. Or let's say that when you're closing the deep layers, you take a little more care in terms of really aligning and taking that tension off the wound on the side you want. So not that you do that consciously, but it can happen. So when you look at a trial, think about that. Now, there's a third mechanism that everybody knows that takes care of another aspect of pre-knowledge, and that is blinding. So blinding means that the pre-knowledge of what treatment you got afterwards is unknown. So the patient doesn't know after the treatment which treatment they got. Maybe the surgeon doesn't know which treatment if it's something like a medication. But often the surgeon has to know because you're changing different techniques, which is why you often have independent evaluators that are blinded. So if the evaluator doesn't know, then that helps as well. So let's think about how that might work. 
Say you as a surgeon know, and we're having a study, and you're comparing your favorite breast reduction technique versus technique B. And you know which that patient got, and you're seeing them in the post-operative thing, uh, period, in the exam room, and you unconsciously convey either your happiness because you think it looks great because it was the procedure you like the best, or you're conveying to the patient uh, you're not so pumped about the result because you know that it wasn't the one. So the more we can hide and blind uh, the patient and the treating physician or the evaluator from this, the more that we can eliminate that chance that bias can creep in. So in conclusion, there are three mechanisms that we can use to really help mitigate the effect of pre-knowledge and how it helps we conduct a trial and how we may interpret it. And there are three mechanisms that we can use to help mitigate the effect of pre-knowledge on how we conduct and how we assess the results of a clinical trial. Randomization helps us address pre-knowledge of patient factors or other factors that may put us into one treatment group or another. Allocation concealment helps us take away the potential influence of our pre-knowledge of which treatment the patient has been assigned to and so that we don't treat them different or they don't treat themselves differently. And then third is blinding. So the less we know about what was done to the patient, the less the patient knows about what, the more that the patient and the evaluator that's independent can really look and not be influenced in terms of making assessment on what the outcomes really were. So to find out more about how to uh, run a clinical trial or how to assess a clinical trial, why don't you go to the consort website? No, this is not a dating website for uh, high-priced consorts of royalty. This is a website for the consort study group. Consort stands for Consolidated Standard for Reporting Trials. And the most recent version was in 2010. So they have a position statement about how this should be done in a very standard way. They have a 25-point checklist that you can look at, which includes things like blinding and allocation concealment. And it also has a very nice flow diagram that's standardized to let it know when these different factors happen within the process of the trial. So why don't you go take a look? You see their website there.